Even though Trump speaks almost exclusively to friendly outlets, he has broadened his horizons this election cycle. The New York Times reports this week on Trump's new strategy to court what is being called the Manoverse, a constellation of YouTubers, pranksters, and streamers with massive online followings. The aim here is to target young men and to exploit and deepen the existing gender divide between Trump supporters and Harris supporters. And these streamers in the Manoverse, all of whom are young, white men, they have hosted Trump on their online channels for what might technically be called interviews, but really defy any sort of journalistic characterization. I would just do cocaine. That was really, well, yeah. So not just, yeah. That's, and that's it was down and that's down and dirty, right? Yeah, and this is yeah. This I mean, it was yeah. Is cocaine a stronger? Uh, oh yeah. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cocaine. So, you, so you're way up with cocaine more than anything else you can think cocaine of. Cocaine will turn you into a damn owl, homie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It'll you'll be you'll be out on your own porch. You know, yeah. it, you'll you'll be your own street lamp. With hard hitting conversations like that, who really needs journalism? Trump will, of course, have to take questions from actual reporters next week when he and Vice President Harris face off for the first time in a televised debate. And just a few hours ago, ABC News released the rules for that debate. There will be no live audience. Candidates will get two minutes for each answer, as well as two minutes for rebuttals and one minute for additional follow-ups. And crucially, when one candidate is speaking, the other candidate's microphone will be muted. Joining me now is Jonathan Martin, Politico's senior political columnist. Jay Mart, thank you for being here. Um, first, this is thoughts, not muted. This is live. Not, this is well, hot. Well, and thank worry. golly for that. Um, do you think it matters? I know the Harris campaign was reluctant to agree to, agree to this debate until they resolved this issue of whether yeah. Donald Trump would be heard, presumably um, talking over her or talking during her answers. He will not be, at least his mic will not be live. Do you think that matters from a sort of political standpoint? It's hard to judge but now, Alex, because we don't know what we're missing, right? I mean, it's kind of like trying to figure out, well, if Trump had been on a hot mic and had said something outlandish or offensive, well, now we're not going to know because obviously he's not going to have a hot mic, which is precisely why the Harris campaign was determined to try to keep the mics hot because, of course, their strategy revolves around Donald Trump saying outlandish things uh, and holding that up to the American voters. Um, it's interesting, the contrast. Of course, the Biden folks in June didn't want the mic to be hot, and they didn't want a live audience, you recall, either, because they didn't want the Trump show to overwhelm uh, the debate. And they didn't want Biden to take the bait, frankly, and get into the kind of back and forth that they eventually still did, famously, over their, their golf games. Who could forget that? The, the Harris folks, a different strategy. They, I think, don't think the Harris would take the bait, and they did think that Trump would blurt something out offensive. Well, and she hasn't taken the bait, even from a distance, when he's questioning her exactly. racial identification and so forth. Her yep. response has been, let's move on, effectively. I mean, I do think your point, though, about the outlandishness of the Trump brand being either a liability or an asset, right? Here we see one instance where maybe in a debate context it's a liability. But totally. you, you hear these interviews he's doing in the so-called Manoverse, yeah. where he's talking to young men about coke and how high you get when you do cocaine. <laughs> and it's like, that seems like he wants that to be part of his brand message, right? That doesn't seem like he's been lured into an unsuspecting interview with a crazy YouTuber. Yeah. I yeah. just wonder, first of all, just the Manoverse has not existed before this election cycle. Am what? I correct, correct in believing that? Uh, at least I have not been familiar with that. Look, I think podcasts obviously were around the previous cycle. I don't know if you had the extent or the sort of audience that a lot of these podcasts have. Um, what it tells us about Trump is that the, it's 145th example of how Trump breaks the mold of most candidates for president, Alex. Typically, candidates for president want to do two things. They want to persuade voters and they want to mobilize voters, persuasion and mobilization. Uh, Trump has never been interested in persuasion. It's an all-mobilization strategy. He's not trying to convince somebody who's wavering or per skeptical. He's trying to find more adherents who just might not vote at all. And the Manaverse is one example of that. But also, look at what he rolls out 
after the Democratic convention. It's not a sort of centrist Republican who has come around to the MAGA cause. It's Tulsi Gabbard and RFK Jr. Right. Because the, the, the strategy is to deepen and find folks deeper instead of broadening. Uh, he wants to find the, the, the person that's not going to vote at all or was going to vote for RFK that could vote for him. He's not looking for a voter who was for Harris or Biden previously. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think there's a novelty in that strategy, but it also seems kind of risky. I mean, the New York Times, Very in its risky. reporting about the Manaverse, says I think it's like a third of the young men in this yes. who are, you know, adherents of the Manaverse, residents in the Manaverse, who say they plan to vote for Trump did not vote in 2020. Exactly. These are guys right. who were who were animated by sports talk and That's sneaker right. talk and not political talk. And That's Trump right. has kind of opened up a portal in the universe for them to be part of their manoverse. Yeah, and at the, the same time, it's it's a, it's a big assumption that they're going to actually get out there and vote. That's precisely the risk, is that these are not 60-plus-year-old folks that had voted in every primary and general election like good citizens for the last, you know, 30-plus years. These are kids who maybe, if they have one too many bong hits, are not going to show up and pull the lever for anybody on Election Day because they're not going to get off the couch. And I think that's the real risk when you bank your campaign on mobilization and don't do really any persuasion. Don't forget. Nikki Haley was winning voters for months after she dropped out of the race in a Republican primary. Uh, look, some of those are Democrats making mischief, but a lot of them are traditional kind of bushy Republicans uh, who have not gotten a touch uh, from Trump, who are still out there trying to figure out what they do. Harris, Trump, or none of the above. That voter to me is really interesting, and they're not in the manaverse. Let me just... Just say for the record, I don't think the kids do bong hits anymore. They have a lot of options on that front, J-Mart, but we'll save that I for offline. Okay. We'll save that, yeah. We'll save that for another discussion offline. Google it, kids. Bong hits. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> I do want to bring up, though, I mean, I don't think that the Harris campaign is intending on having a gendered strategy by launching this reproductive freedom bus tour, as they did earlier this week. Yeah. I don't think reproductive freedom should be a gendered issue, but the fact of the matter is, it is in American politics, but it is an issue that where Democrats yeah. have a proven track record of winning on, right? Abortion actually sure. brings voters out. Sure. If you are pursuing either the gendered man of our strategy of Trump or the gen, I will call it gendered, but not intentionally. So yeah. perhaps more directed at women's strategy of Harris on the abortion question. Who do who do you think like which hand would you rather have? Uh, certainly, if you look at the history of American politics since the Dobbs decision in June of 2022, I, clearly you would have to say the Kamala Harris strategy. Um, but I wouldn't recommend that either. Uh, look, I don't think that she's pursuing just a gender strategy, uh, but I don't think it would be wise if she, if she was to do that. But obviously, between those two, uh, the more likely voter to come out, to your point earlier, would be the woman responding to the issue of abortion rights. I do have to ask, as we talk, talk about the study in contrasts here, it's not just the ordering of donuts and J.D. Vance's seeming right. incapability of picking between cinnamon rolls, I think glazed, yeah. those with sprinkles, and yeah. Tim Walz's just obvious comfort ordering whoopie pies and pumpkin. All of the above, yeah. All right. of the above. Yeah. Um, I, when we talk about, like, the emissary to the white working class, Tim Walls is camped out in Pennsylvania. Kamala Harris, the Harris campaign announced she will be in Pittsburgh until the debate. They are yeah. really trying to plant a flag there. And I just wonder whether you think Democrats in this new ticket have a, a kind of a better shot. At, at that group of, of voters that are a huge part of, oh, I still you know, think it's going to be really difficult. Tell me more. I, I mean, I think it transcends the nominees of the party. I think that there there are broader trends uh, on education polarization in this country that are moving working class voters to the GOP across racial lines, and it's frankly the biggest challenge that Kamala Harris faces. Uh, it, traditionally, Democrats are the party of the working class, and th that 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 is sort of uh, diminished. Uh, you know, in recent cycles, and I think the, the the biggest challenge she faces, Nevada, Arizona, North Carolina, Georgia, Pennsylvania, you name it, working class voters, especially working class men, white, black, Hispanic, uh, can she mitigate her losses among that group? That's going to be, I think, a huge driver as to whether or not she can get 270, Alex. And that's why she's in New Hampshire talking about a uh, new economic agenda. Uh, J-Mart, the man who knows politics 
so, so well, even if he does not know that much about THC delivery systems. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure. Not in the 21st century, at least. Good clarification. Thank you for your time tonight, my friend. Thanks, Alex.